So our next speaker is Charlotte Bodiger. Charlotte was a student of Allison's and she's currently at UNC. Charlotte. So like um, Ulrich, I also met Allison about exactly 21 years ago when I was interviewing for graduate school. And uh, she was the very first faculty member that I interviewed at the first school that I interviewed at. And as you might guess, that's a nerve wracking experience, except what I remember was mental fireworks. She had me at hello and I could have quit right then um, with my interviews. Uh, but. Um, uh, I dreamed of coming back to talk at UCSF for about 20 years, and I'm really sad that it's under these circumstances, and I'm really honored um, to participate today. Um, and I'm lucky that Ulrika went um, in front of me because she already set up the problem of alcoholism to some extent, so I don't have to go into a lot of detail about that. So I was Allison's third student, and I fledged probably the furthest from the nest. Um, but I'm going to show you how it really all makes sense. Um, and that what I loved, of one of the many things I loved about Allison is that she clearly saw um, the logic of that as well. I'm going to say a couple things about Allison at the beginning, and I apologize for anyone who is at the, UCF, or the, the SFN Memorial because I mentioned those things there as well. Um, and then I'm not going to talk about personal things because I'll cry, um, and I don't want to do that. I might cry anyway, but I'm going to cry less. Um, later this afternoon, I might talk about other personal things when there's more of an open mic situation. Um, but so in my, and also in honor of Allison, I'm going to try to pack way too much um, into this, more than any reasonable person could think could be fit into this short talk. But So at the beginning, I'm going to talk about some of the legacies, the really lasting things that Allison gave me that continue to have value on a daily basis, even though I've kind of gone far afield from um, the training that I got um, with her. Um, and so this is a little story about when I gave Allison the first draft of my first paper um, when I was working in her lab. And when she gave me back my comments, and everyone who's ever written a paper with her knows how full of comments that paper was. Um, but in addition to all those comments, she gave me a copy of this paper right here. And uh, of course, I was mortified <laughs> because what she was essentially telling me was that I had a lot to learn about writing. Um, but this is such a valuable tool, and I force all my students to read it. Um, I force my undergraduates and graduates in my courses to read it. I test them on it to really prove that they have read this paper. And it changed the way I write. And the principles of it are fantastic, and I'm really grateful to her for sharing it with me. Um, and no matter what field you're in, being a good technical writer um, is, is an important skill. Um, and next story I'm going to tell about Allison um, is something that um, the rest of my talk is sort of meant to embody how I've tried to follow her lead um, on this. Um, when we submitted my first paper, um, it was using slice um, uh, electrophysiology techniques, which Allison had never done any work in that area. And one of the reviewers um, of that first paper said, Dr. Dope should stick to research using the in vivo electrophysiology techniques in which she is expert. And um, the words she used in response to that are not safe for work, as people say <laughs> these days. Um, and if Allison had stuck to the kinds of uh, techniques she was originally trained in, this is her first um, neuroscience paper that was published, she would have been doing um, uh, in vitro cell culture for the rest of her career. And uh, Allison would have none of this. Um, she was fearless in taking on new techniques. She was question driven and she would do branch into whatever area seemed like it was going to be the best way to answer the question she was interested in. Um, and um, in response to reviewer two, we got the first birdsong paper in the Journal of Neurophysiology and we got the cover. So there. Um, and <laughs> she. <laughs> She taught me to focus on questions and to be fearless about techniques. Um, and you might ask yourself, well, okay, and so then I'm gonna show this, I, especially. 
I especially love this picture because it shows the face that was the reinforcement signal that we were working towards always. You wanted to have that face looking at you. She was so excited and interested in what you were talking about and you just, it was a, a very powerful reinforcer. Um, and here is another picture from um, my favorite annual holiday event, which was Dope Lab Christmas Party, um, where she was cooking for us and, and having champagne. It's noon in Newfoundland, as she would like to say. Um, so I owe her a tremendous amount. Um, I idolized her, and um, I'm going to stop talking about personal stuff. Um, and talk about, just to bring you along with me, how did I go from here, um, studying the song system, um, to here. So a lot of what I do now is brain imaging work with human subjects, although I'm not actually going to talk about any neuroimaging or fMRI day uh, today, but um, I'm going to uh, walk you through a little bit of how uh, it feels like a logical progression um, to me and then to tell you um, some stories about one particular line of work um, that I've been following for a number of years. So. Um, here's the song system, and here's a particular part of the song system that I was focused on um, as a graduate student. Um, and this part of the brain, um, this anterior forebrain circuit, receives a big dopaminergic input um, from the, um, the midbrain um, of, in the bird. And this um, circuitry is highly homologous to um, the circuitry that's uh, used to generate other kinds of motivated behavior. So song is a motivated reproductive behavior, um, and uh, mammals have a homologous circuit that's organized in some ways uh, in a similar fashion. It also receives midbrain dopamine projection up to um, a cortical-like um, area and a, um, a striatal or basal ganglia um, region. You can make uh, circuit diagrams showing the um, homologies here. Um, and when I was a graduate student, there weren't a, a torrent of papers in the birdsong field that were coming out. And Howard Fields can attest that I started getting very interested in the addiction literature um, early in my graduate career, and I read that uh, work avidly and found that this circuit um, was the cousin of the circuit I was actually working on, and I knew that I wanted to move over to this circuit um, as a postdoc, and in trying to choose what area in particular within the addiction field I wanted to focus on, um, I tried to um, identify uh, an area where I saw a gap. Um, so as Ulrich had mentioned, it's a huge problem, so I'll skip over that. Um, but in the field, the majority of the work um, that's been done to try to develop um, new medications, for example, or new treatment approaches are based on bottom-up work with animal models. Um, some of it is the beautiful, elegant uh, work in um, invertebrates, but the majority of it actually is um, from rodent models. And one problem with this is that there are quite a number of reasons why uh, a rat might decide to stop pressing a bar for cocaine, and not all of those reasons are going to be um, uh, reasons that will translate well to a clinical setting. Um, and so uh, one of the reasons that I um, feel like we end up failing um, in clinical trials in the addiction field um, is this area that I've highlighted in green. So this is a human brain where I've um, demarcated in green the prefrontal cortex, and you can see it's a really large um, proportion of our brain. Um, and our closest relative, the chimp, it's a much smaller proportion, and when we look down in the rat, you can't even see any of it, which is a little bit unfair, because it's actually on the medial surface of the cortex um, in the rat, but it's small um, in comparison. And so as a good neuroethologist, if I wanted to try to understand uh, executive function, the neural mechanisms of executive dysfunction, um, I should go to the system in which um, the neural circuit is hypertrophied, um, and that's the human. Um, so that's how I moved over there, and that projection from the midbrain dopamine cells up to the cortex is one that I'm gonna bring up um, again later, um, uh, and will be sort of an underlying piece um, of this. And the other underlying theme will be the voracious adaptation of new techniques. Um, so, um, uh, in particular, the kind of approach we take to, in my lab, to um, addiction is to try to identify and characterize intermediate phenotypes, neurocognitive intermediate phenotypes for addiction. Um, it's a growing um, approach to these complex neurobehavioral disorders, which um, are characterized by um, uh, 
massive complexity. So uh, any one person who um, is, has a substance use disorder may be quite unlike other people who have a substance use disorder. So alcoholism as a phenotype is a crappy phenotype. How are you ever going to get to the biology of that um, when the phenotype is so ill-defined? So trying to define these intermediate phenotypes, which are etiologically uh, simpler, um, uh, I think is going to be one answer um, to this uh, question. So they're complex neurobehavioral disorders with a lot of different sub-traits. And these traits are not independent. In many uh, cases, they interact. And um, for um, any one addicted person, there may be um, over-representation of particular um, sub-traits versus another person may have a different um, uh, constellation of, uh, of sub-traits. And uh, I'm going to talk about one particular area um, of work in my lab focused on um, a um, intermediate phenotype, which is um, immediate reward selection bias. So the tendency to choose now over later, um, an immediate good over a, a larger delayed good. So what's the relationship? Um, essentially, this is the, uh, in a nutshell, the problem of relapse. Do I decide to have that martini now or not? Um, and if I'm an alcoholic, you know, by uh, definition, if I do this, if I make this choice, I'm going to lose control um, over my drinking, and it's going to end badly. Although, in the immediate term, it may have some positive consequences. It's going to change my effective state um, to a better, um, a better effective state than, um, than before. Four, and I may feel um, uh, bummed out um, if I uh, choose to forego that drink. But the next morning, you know what happens? It always turns out this way. Um, and mine, you know, meanwhile, if I had stayed sober, maybe I would discover radium or something the next day. <laughs> And as these decisions accumulate over time, um, someone who continues to make these poor choices immediate over um, delayed gratification, you, you know, they ruin their lives, they ruin their bodies. Um, and um, I think in some ways this may be a fundamental um, uh, intermediate phenotype for addiction. Um, so we want to understand it. What's the neurobiology of this? So as a good neuroethologist, first we want to try to define the behavior as, um, as solidly as possible. Um, so some early studies, um, we were able to show that sober alcoholics, people who have been clean for many years even, they tend to choose a smaller immediate reward more often than a larger delayed reward relative to healthy control subjects. Um, we've been able to replicate this in many samples. Um, and some early studies with um, a pharmacological agent naltrexone suggested the hypothesis that frontal dopamine might be playing a role in modulating this behavior. And to try to get at that, um, to test that hypothesis more directly, we didn't have a lot of tools. There are no good pharmacological agents. Um, uh, there weren't, at least at that time, no good pharmacological agents to, um, to probe frontal dopamine function. There were no good pet agents to isolate frontal dopamine um, signaling. And so we used a genetic tool. Um, so suddenly I'm jumping over into genetics, human behavior, um, fMRI, that's those two new things, but now let's do some genetics. Um, and we focused on a polymorphism in um, a gene encoding the COMT enzyme, which catabolizes dopamine. And up here in the cortex, and particularly the prefrontal cortex where there's a lot of dopamine, um, COMT plays a major role in regulating the levels of dopamine. Um, the dopamine transporter is very sparse there, um, so it plays a, a key role. And um, as luck would have it, there are two variants um, in this gene where um, a single uh, nucleotide change causes a functional um, change in the enzyme, where um, the MET um, variant, which is a um, derived um, variant, is hypoactive. And it ends up producing uh, an enzyme that's about fourfold less active, um, which leads to more dopamine being available. Um, and these variants are about equally common um, in the population, although that varies a bit with ethnicity. But on average, um, if I just surveyed the room, we'd get about 50% heterozygotes, we'd get about 25% of each type of homozygote, which makes it uh, a nice um, a tool to, um, to study uh, populations without, without having to find these rare um, uh, variants. 
And so we asked, um, do, uh, does the um, genotype at this polymorphism predict choice behavior independent of substance abuse history? Um, and in fact, we saw that it did. So people with the low dopamine um, variant choose the, uh, the immediate reward more often independent of their um, uh, alcohol use history. Um, and we were able to replicate this in a larger sample, um, although we found that the effects were age dependent. So in adults, um, low dopamine um, in the uh, cortex is associated, putative low dopamine in the cortex is associated with greater impulsive choice. Um, but in uh, late adolescence, um, that relationship was different. Um, and I'm gonna come back to some studies that are uh, designed to probe that um, uh, towards the very end. Um, and we have a model for how this um, might be explained, though, since um, late adolescents are at their peak dopamine production. They have the most dopamine signaling they're ever going to have in their lives. Um, it's all downhill from there until we get Parkinson's disease. Um, and if we map out the different genotypes and uh, make a hypothetical um, developmental trajectory, you can see that um, these um, met, met folks are on the edge of um, too much dopamine um, uh, early on, but then they come down to this optimal range, but these foul valves, while they're um, choosing relatively wisely as late adolescents, um, as they age, boom, they become less uh, adaptive in their decision making. And this U-shaped curve where impulsive choice and frontal dopamine um, are related by um, a U-shaped curve is something I'm gonna bring back again and again. Um, we next wanted to ask, so, what about if we manipulate frontal dopamine? And we chose to take advantage of essentially a natural experiment, um, which is uh, caused by the fact that among females who are naturally cycling, there's a big estrogen rise that happens um, around mid-cycle, and dopamine signaling um, increases at that time as well. And so we tested female subjects um, first in the um, first couple of days of their cycle, and then um, at mid-cycle, um, to ask, does delay discounting go down? Does immediate reward bias go down at mid-cycle? We predicted that it would, and I wouldn't tell you this probably if it didn't, um, but it does, and um, this is just looking at all of the females in our sample um, as a whole, um, but we also measured estradiol levels at those two time points, and when we separate people according to whether they actually had an estrogen rise um, in the white bars here um, or not, um, it's in fact the effect was restricted to um, the women who actually had a rise in estradiol, suggesting a possible um, mechanism that estradiol may be driving this effect, although there's more work to be done to fully answer that question. Um, and moreover, this effect was driven by the, um, the VAL carriers, the relatively lower dopamine um, women. Um, so they benefited most from this rise in, um, in estrogen at mid-cycle and presumably a rise in dopamine. So we'd like to do some um, PET studies to verify that that's actually the mechanism, but it continues to support this idea that Dopamine um, signaling changes, um, particularly in the frontal cortex, may play a role in shaping this kind of decision-making behavior. Finally, in going the other direction, we wanted to deplete dopamine signaling and see if we could um, shift um, behavior that way. Um, and again, we see that the low dopamine folks here, shown in yellow, if we um, deplete dopamine using a, um, a by giving them a beverage, an amino acid beverage that's deficient in the precursors for dopamine, um, we can uh, make them even more impulsive um, than they are um, at baseline. And this effect is not seen um, in the um, people that have a reasonable level um, of, uh, or a more, uh, a higher level of uh, tonic dopamine signaling. Um, and I should note here that these are all adults, no adolescents in this group, and they're all males. Um, so it's sort of classic uh, rat type um, approaches where we focus on adult males rather than the whole population, but they're much simpler. I understand now why people do that. <laughs> Um, but again, here's our model um, where we've got impulsive choice on the y-axis and frontal dopamine increasing here. Here's our valval low dopamine guys, and here's when people with at least one metallial. And when we deplete their dopamine, um, these guys stay around the bowl um, and maintain relatively optimal decision making, and these guys shoot up and become even more impulsive than they are to begin with. Um, so um, we know that um, scant bit of evidence that COMT enzyme activity 
varies across the lifespan. Um, so there's not just a genetic effect on this enzyme's function, but also epigenetic um, uh, effects as well. Is that my, okay, I'm sorry. There's a lot of variation within genotype, and that led us to do um, a methylation study to try to identify methylation sites across the gene. All these blue spots are CPG islands where there's methylation going on, and we found there is indeed um, uh, massive amounts of variation across individuals on this direction here um, in terms of methylation at multiple sites, um, with one so far that we've seen um, correlation with um, uh, gene expression in cell lines. So we're currently doing a larger scale study to try to understand what are the functional units of methylation in this gene and what are the upstream and downstream um, factors that uh, are related to those methylation differences. And what about striatal dopamine? Um, we know that alcoholics have relatively low uh, levels of dopamine in the striatum, so we asked does low um, striatal dopamine tone um, also associate with um, more impulsive choice, and it does. So people with low levels of dopamine um, in the putamen, specifically um, within the um, striatum, are more impulsive. Um, and this is independent after controlling for um, CUMT genotype, and all these are healthy controls with no um, substance abuse history. Um, and with that, I'll thank all the people in my lab who have helped do this work, and thank everybody for their time. And sorry if I ran late. <laughs>